is so, so good. And I hope you are really aware of that. He is an amazing, amazing, Amen. amazing Amen. God. And I am just so blessed to be here with you guys tonight. Oh, yes. And I hope you're ready because you're going to learn go. something that will help edify your spirit. So I really, oh, really yeah. am geared uh, to get started. But before we do that, I just want us to get into a time of prayer right now. So just raise your hands wherever you are and just begin to pray right now. Just pray as the Spirit of God leads. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we just give you thanks, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for every person who is watching. Thank you, Almighty God, for this word that you are about to release to your people in the mighty name of Jesus. Just pray, just pray, just pray wherever you are. Let your spirit be open to receive whatever the Lord has prepared for tonight. Just open up your spirit right now in prayer, just for another minute. Pray, pray, pray right now, wherever you are. Masi krokoska tabarahande kosha karabasunda kabaha terekosa sinda rabaka hunda kashka tarabaha lindoro koski anama kishkota bahande yakos rikos kanama hati kosha katabaka hande. Thank you, Almighty God. We know something new is about to happen tonight. We know something good is about to happen tonight. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Hallelujah. Glory be be to God. Praise the Lord. I just want to start off by honoring our man of God, the main man himself. I just want us to appreciate Prophet Ubed Angel, uh, whom I'm standing in for tonight. Glory be to God. <laughs> So, yes, the shoes I try to feel are extremely big, of course. Uh, massive, massive shoe size. Um, but I am just so blessed uh, to also uh, be a follower, a daughter in the spirit uh, to the prophet as well. So he's also my prophet. He's also my teacher. He's also my pastor. And uh, therefore, I am a product of his grace as well. So I just want to appreciate him right now and just thank the Lord abundantly for his life. May you live long, 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 prophet you, but angel, for my own sake. I don't know about others, but for my sake. Hallelujah. All right. So I just want us to get into today's word very, very quickly. So if you open your Bibles to the book of James, I don't want to keep you too long. So we have to move quickly. And uh, so if you didn't have uh, your Bible, I don't know why you were tuning in because this is church. All right. Okay, so James uh, chapter number one, that's where we are going. And I can see people are tuned in from everywhere. Welcome, welcome. And you guys already know that you have to share the broadcast. It goes without saying, you have to share the broadcast. You can't watch alone. You can't be selfish about the gospel. So you need to share it. Tell someone, we are live. Tell them, you're about to learn something that will change your life forever. So it's very, very important. So there is quite a lot that I want to... Um, fit into today, uh, but I know that you will catch it as we go. So I'll move very quickly and summarize. And your homework is to go and study again and again and again. All right. It's very important. But in everything I'm saying is not new anyway. This is all think teachings uh, that Prophet has already taught us. So it's uh, a good revision. Okay. So are you there, James chapter one, verse one? I'll read it. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are already flying. If you are not concentrating, <laughs> then you are already left behind. And it's, don't let it be practiced for the actual leaving behind, okay? <laughs> so, so it says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings, okay? Now, just to give you a little bit of a background um, before we go into the next verse, James, uh, to those who don't know, was Jesus' brother. Some people don't know that, but James was actually Jesus' half-brother. Okay, so Jesus had brothers and sisters, just in case you don't know. Joseph, Junior, <laughs> Jude, these are actually brothers that were mentioned. I'm not kidding when I say Joseph, Junior. There was a brother of Jesus called Joseph. And uh, he also had sisters, but the sisters are not mentioned by name. So uh, we are dealing, uh, when we are reading the book of James, I want you to always remember that you're dealing with somebody who was Jesus' sibling. Now imagine, it must have been very difficult uh, for uh, Jesus' uh, siblings to grow up with him. It must have been very, very hard. And it's no wonder that these guys did not believe in Jesus' ministry. They were skeptics, all of them, including the very James we're about to read. None of them believed in him. The uh, Bible says it. It says all of his siblings, they were like, mm -mm, we don't believe this guy. Um, imagine growing up with him. They must have um, 
had some kind of contempt towards him. Uh, I mean, this all perfect brother, he makes no mistake, never lies like you, never steals like you. When uh, everybody else gets in trouble, not Jesus. Jesus is the poster uh, child. He's perfect. Um, and he has an extra ordinary moral campus. Uh, while you are checking out the girls, he's not even interested in all of that. He's just praying. He's always in the uh, synagogue. He's always reading the scriptures. Imagine having a brother like that. It must have been annoying for these guys. And uh, it's no wonder they never believed in his ministry. They were like, no way, I'm not going to believe in him. But you see, something happened uh, to James because uh, when you look at the Bible, um, Jesus, when he after he resurrected, he actually appeared to James personally. He actually decided, I need to go and visit my brother. You see, so there was a kind of this uh, thing that he had to prove um, his ministry to James. He had to prove who he was to James. It was so important for Jesus to do that to the extent that he had to appear to him personally, even before he appeared to the apostles. He made sure to pay a visit to James after resurrection. So imagine uh, James's... Um, absolute awe after actually realizing that, wow, my brother truly is the king of kings. He truly is the Messiah. It must have been an amazing, amazing and humbling uh, feeling for James. So this is the guy that we're reading uh, from today. So imagine how he starts uh, his book. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he's trying to really be specific here that I'm not just a servant of God, even my own brother. I am a servant to him too. You see, so even though he was my brother, he's also my king. He's also my savior. He's also my master. He's also my redeemer. So he's trying to really make that specific. Okay, so uh, then he says um, uh, uh, in James uh, 1, actually, let's just skip uh, so that we quickly move. I know there's so much that I want to uh, tell you today. Hopefully we'll have a part two. <laughs> All right, so let's um, go over to James chapter, okay, same chapter, just go to verse 13. He says, let no man say when he is tempted all right. This is where we're starting. It says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither can tempteth he any man, neither can he also tempt somebody. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. All right. So what he is trying um, to say here, if you look at the word tempted, is the word perazzo, which means to devastate, to crush and to destroy. So in other words, James is trying to address th these are things people were saying at the time. So he was addressing what the people were saying. He would hear people say, oh, well, I'm just suffering these days and I am just going through a whole lot of things. You know, God has sent me temptation. Uh, God is just tempting me. How many of you actually say that? Oh, this sickness is on me because God is trying to teach me a lesson. This is happening to me because God is trying to whip me up into shape. <laughs> I'm going through this uh, cancer because uh, God is trying to teach me or I'm going through this, I'm going through that or somebody close to me died because uh, God is trying to teach me a lesson. So James is saying, don't ever say that. He's saying, let no man say when he is tempted, perazzo, which means to destroy. Are you getting that? To destroy, to crush, to devastate. He's saying when you are going through the toughest time of your life, when you're going through a whole lot of devastation, never ever say, God is the one who is tempting me. Let no man say that. So whatever tough situation you're going through, don't say that. That's what God, um, James is saying. You see, one thing you need to understand about God is this, uh, for those who are guilty of having said that, uh, especially, uh, I, in fact, I know I said that at one time when I was a baby Christian, I, I was none the wiser. I didn't even know what I was saying. I said, oh, this is happening because I think uh, God wants me to learn something. So this is happening because I'm learning. Uh, and yet Jem says, no, don't ever say that. God doesn't use the devil's tools to teach his children. Imagine this. <laughs> God doesn't... Um, go behind the cross in order to punish you. He doesn't um, undermine the works of the cross in order to punish you. And you really need to understand that that's directly opposing everything that Jesus did. So imagine God in heaven uh, coming off uh, his throne, his seat, and he says, um, 
uh, just hang on a minute. Jesus, I know you did something, but wait, I need to slap this fool. Look at what he's doing. Just hang on, hang on, hang on. I just need to give him a little bit of cancer and then I'll be back shortly. Imagine, that's ridiculous, right? It sounds ridiculous. How does God go behind everything that Jesus did on the cross to punish you? How does he do that? It's impossible. You see, so James is saying, never be caught saying this is happening because God is teaching me a lesson. All right. So it must have hit James in a different way altogether when he heard people saying that, when he heard people accusing his brother of tempting them because he knew the man. He grew up with the man. He even um, resented him because he was so perfect in all his ways. He was a skeptic because of that. He knew him. He knew there is no way my brother would do such a thing, let alone if he is God, him being God, let alone the Messiah himself. He would never, ever cause devastation in your life. Imagine such a powerful word, peraizo. Imagine God causing devastation in your life. Does that sound like him? Amen. Saying now uh, God is just causing devastation in my life. God is crushing me. That's the true meaning of the word tempted there. God is crushing me. It does not make sense. Yet a lot of Christians are guilty guilty of saying just that it's religious thinking i want you to look at um james chapter 1 verse 2 same chapter verse 2 uh, i want to show you something here whenever you are going through um something this is all important and i'm going to get to hupomo but i just want to show you something very quickly before i uh, show you um what hupomo is all about are you there in verse 2? This book is very, very interesting. James is a very interesting book, and I want you to take time to actually read the whole book, okay, in context. That's your homework. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Uh, count it all joy here uh, doesn't exactly mean enjoy trouble. <laughs> uh, enjoy trouble, guys. Uh, it's, uh, it's fun to be in trouble. Doesn't make sense. Okay, so if you look at the word count there, it's actually an accounting term, obviously. You already know what uh, count means. So it simply means to add up. So um, what are you really saying then, James? So you're saying, okay, so if I say trouble plus trouble equals double trouble, <laughs> or uh, what is it exactly that you're saying? But when you look at the original rendering of that word, what James was trying to say was um, uh, weigh everything that is happening around you. Okay, so you're not counting as in uh, one trouble plus the trouble last week, plus also rent problems, also the debt collector. Uh, so how do I count it all joy? That's not what he was saying. So he was saying, weigh everything that is happening around you, all the things that you are going through, and just understand that you are coming out on top. No matter what happens, have so much joy that you are coming out on top. You are going to come out of it. Whatever it is you're facing, you are coming out of it. That's exactly what James was trying to say. So he wasn't exactly saying enjoy all the problems that you're facing and uh, just start um, uh, celebrating uh, just because you've been um, going through so many things and it's okay. No, that's not what he meant. What he meant was, there is always a way out. When you are in Christ, there is always a way out. So he says, count it all joy. When? And I want you to notice how he says when, not if. He says when. In other words, it is going to happen. The Lord Jesus Christ said, in this world, you shall have trouble. You shall, you shall, you shall. You shall have trouble. So he says, when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, if you look at the word uh, fall there, it's, it doesn't uh, insinuate a uh, deliberate fall. Nobody falls on purpose anyway. When something happens, uh, when you make a mistake, it's usually not on purpose. Obviously, there are some champions that do <laughs> things and veterans uh, that do things like that. But nobody falls on purpose. You see? So it's a falling that you don't anticipate. That's the kind of fall that James is talking about here. So he says, when you get into issues, when they take place, things that you never anticipated, there are so many attacks that happen in a Christian's uh, life. The moment you're born again, you were thinking it's going to be smooth sailing and it's just going to be easy. It's going to be happy days and sunny every day. And yet here you are in serious problems. And James has already forbidden us from saying those problems are coming from the Lord. He's already told you, don't ever say God is crushing you. Don't ever say God is devastating you because it's not in his nature to do so. He doesn't use the enemy's tools to teach his own children lessons. So we've already been told that's not how God operates. But he is now trying to say, 
when you do face problems, count it all joy. Weigh the situations and say, you know what? All these situations, they are nothing to the Lord. Amen. This is nothing. I am coming out of this. I am over and above these situations. I count it all joy. So whenever I fall or whenever I experience certain attacks, it can be attacks in your health, it can be attacks uh, um, in your finances, it can be anything, whatever is happening in your life. He says, when you see that happen, count it all joy. And he says, when you fall into diverse temptations, you see, so there are people who are going through a lot of things and you're wondering, okay, so if you're saying God is not responsible for my problems, um, then why am I going through all these things? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why does all this happen? Don't forget the devil is uh, the king of this world. He is the Lord of this world. He was given authority by Adam. When Jesus Christ came, he came to reverse that whole transaction. The power has been transferred to us, but still the devil remains the prince of the airwaves. But we... We have the ability to take charge in any situation in our lives. So the devil cannot touch you. He has no permission to touch you. The only person who gives him permission is you. All right? So to the non-believers, the devil is still in charge in this world. That's why you'll find tsunamis taking place. That's why you'll find babies uh, getting terminal uh, illnesses, people dying of hunger. Because you will always meet somebody, especially when you are evangelizing. You'll always meet the one person who says, if God is really there, why are people dying in Africa of hunger? Uh, why are tsunamis taking place? Why are there earthquakes? Why would God do that? Why is God doing this? Why is God doing that? Why isn't he stopping this? Why isn't he stopping that? Because God is not the king of this, the, this world. He's not the king of the airwaves. The devil is, you see, and it's up to us Christians to take back that authority. In fact, we've already been given the authority. We need to put it into practice. That's all we need to do. All right. So he says, when you fall into diverse temptations, do you see that? Are you guys still there? James 1, 2, right? He says, diverse temptations. And if you look at the word diverse, it means multiple, multiple temptations. And also a very interesting um, definition for that word that I found in the Hebrew is many colors. It means many colors. Imagine, divers means many colors. So it doesn't mean just multiple things. It also means many colors. In other words, problems come in all shades of colors. They can be blue today. Tomorrow you have a green problem. Tomorrow you're going to have a red one. It's going to be uh, 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 an orange one or a black one, red one, whatever it is. So he says problems come in many diverse kinds of temptations. All sorts of things can happen in your life. But count it all joy. No matter what you face, count it all joy. Weigh it all up and see that you are coming out of it. Tell yourself, I am more than a conqueror. There is no way I can continue having these problems. God has already done it for me. I am free. So whenever temptations come, whenever um, destructive things happen to you, whenever uh, you feel like there is a crushing that is happening, understand that it's not coming of God. It is not of God. But do things happen? Do bad things happen? Of course they do. Do challenges come? Of course they do. They come to the best of us, every one of us. Remember Jesus said, in this world you shall what? You shall have trouble. All right, you shall have it. So it takes a mature mind to realize that whenever I go through certain situations, it's not that God has left me. It's not that God is not with me. It's not that I don't have the power. It doesn't mean I'm not born again. It doesn't mean I have to pray the salvation prayer over and over again. It doesn't mean that. I am already a success. I am already a conqueror. I just need to be mature enough to understand that. You see, uh, the difference between us and a lot of people is this. I, I have had people come to me and say, uh, but you never panicked when certain things happen and you are told bad news. Say, how come you never panicked? You were just like that. You see, I am an expert at poker faces. You will never know what's happening. <laughs> and uh, so they always say to me, how come you didn't panic? How come you didn't show anything at all? Why? It's because I understand who I am. I understand that I am a majority wherever I go. I am not alone. I am not just me walking. I have Christ on the inside of me. My whole members are him. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. And so it's time you realized, if you're a Christian, that there are certain things that happen. But I need to now learn how to weigh the things and realize that God's name is above those things. God is always above those things. Are you hearing me? I hope you are really catching this.
And then what does he say in verse 3? He said, knowing this, all right, so understanding all these things that we've talk, we, are, we are talking about, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now, that word knowing is the word ginosko, and that knowing implies it's a continual knowing. So you know this again and again and again. Keep knowing, keep knowing, keep knowing, keep knowing every day. Keep knowing, keep knowing. That's what it implies. So he said, knowing this, in other words, keep it in your head. Remind yourself of this, that the trying of your faith, all right? <laughs> we are about to get there. That the trying of your faith, huh, the trying of my faith. Okay, the trying of my faith. In other words, there's going to be some proving that's going to be taking place here. The trying of my faith. My faith has to be proven somewhere. There are going to be trying times that I need to prove somewhere. Okay, so the trying or the proving of your faith worketh patience. Did you catch that? So when you, the devil comes at you, in other words, this is the kind of trying, when the t devil comes at you, you tell him, so is that the best you can do, devil? Really, seriously? I really think you really hit like a girl. Really, I'm, I'm serious. There's nothing that I feel, no matter what. <laughs> All right. So that's the trying of your faith. The trying of your faith. Okay. So he says, knowing this, in other words, keep on knowing and knowing that the trying, the proving, where we see the proof of your faith, where it's no longer church service and you're excited because there's so many people in church. In fact, this whole lockdown, right now, UK is back in lockdown, officially starting from tonight. We are back in lockdown tomorrow, everywhere, closed again. So if anything, um, and this is what I was saying uh, to uh, people in Birmingham last week. I said, if anything, this lockdown has really taught you to be a mature Christian fast. You had to grow up quickly. Ever heard your parents um, scolding you when you were young? And they would say, grow up. Why can't you grow up? <laughs> and it felt like an insult, like, oh, so this person is really saying I'm acting like a baby here. All right. All, right? All right. And this is exactly what God demands of you now. Grow up. Some of you have been a Christian 10 years, and yet we see no proof of that 10 years. You still act like a baby. Any form of a small little problem, you are crying. See, God, why are you tempting me again? God, you are back again with problems on me. You are pouring more problems on me, God. <laughs> you start again. 10 years a Christian, 15 years a Christian, five years. And some of you say, wow, I'm still fresh in this whole, you know, uh, Christianity thing. Just two years alone. Two years. A two year old even knows how to eat meat. They are not drinking milk still. They are eating meat already. And here you are a Christian for two years, and still you desire milk like a baby. It's time you grow up. Amen. It's very, very important. And right now in these perilous times, there's no time to be acting like a baby. You need to step up. Right. There's no more time. All right. So here we are. It says, knowing this, that the trying, the proving of your faith, worketh patience. What does that really mean? Very, very important uh, statement. Hmm, very, very important. And the way Prophet was teaching this, he said something very, very important. He said, the moment you repel that attack, all right? So an attack comes to you and keep that scripture on the screen. I want you to keep looking at that uh, scripture. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, the moment you are tried, no, the moment something happens, all right? The trying of your faith, the proving of your faith, the moment you are attacked, the moment you say, no way you are touching me, devil. No way you are coming in my household. No way you are touching my children. No way you are touching my business. No way you are touching anything that is around me. The moment you do that, oh, Sakara Bahate. <laughs> the moment you do that, it says, there is a working of patience that happens somewhere. The moment you repel that attack. God releases something in your body. When he sees you repel that attack, the moment you do that behind the scenes, God pours something over on you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. And that's what the Bible calls hupomone, wow. patience. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now, the Bible here, the translation is not 
accurate here when he talks about patience. Because the moment he says, um, your faith worketh patience, you're now thinking about the patience where you're just being patient. <laughs> Whereas a more accurate meaning would be endurance. Endurance would work better on this one rather than just the usual, uh, normal way you use patience. All right? So that's the word hupomone, that word that you see patience. That's the word hupomone. Hupo means under. All right? It's split into two. Hupo is under. And then the word mone is I abide. So in other words, under I abide. Okay? Now I want to show you something. This is the only time that this word abide, the only other time abide is even used in the Bible, and it was used by Jesus. I want to, um, uh, I want to uh, show you uh, where it is exactly that um, it comes up. Go to John 15, verse 4, very quickly. I'm about to close. I told you uh, we're going to be moving at the speed of light. Okay, so are you there? John chapter 15, verse 4. Are you there? It says abide. In other words, meno. Remember? Hupo mone. So we have mone, meno, all right? In me. Abide in me. And I in you. So in other words, if you abide in me, you've made the decision to stay put and not move. You are to be kept in me. All right? That's what that means. Okay, so when we go back to hupo mone, God is then saying, so when you have a heavy load, uh, for instance, and uh, you are under a heavy load, um, you are now saying, okay, so I may be facing all these problems, but I am sort of protected under someone. I'm abiding in him. There is a hupomone that is taking place. I am abiding under someone here. So whenever um, all these things uh, happen in my life, all these attacks, people are slandering you, people are saying all sorts of bad things against you, you understand that I am under someone here. I am abiding under a certain anointing. I am abiding under my God. I am kept. In fact, I also like that um, uh, meaning of the word. It says being kept. I am also kept, secured in Christ. Oh, glory, hallelujah. Are you seeing this? Yeah. So I am not bending. I am not breaking. If you want to know what I'm made of, this is the best time that you're going to see exactly what I'm made of. So whenever I'm going through uh, certain situations, I'm not going to be uh, rolling over and playing dead so the devil doesn't hit me anymore. I'm going to stand up and say, you know what? I am abiding under a certain material that the devil cannot penetrate through. I am abiding under him. I am untouchable. I am unkillable, like Prophet usually says. <laughs> Nothing can happen to me. Nothing can touch me. Why? Because of hupomone. There is a patience, a patience that has been worked, a hupomone that has been worked through me. Whenever I face a situation and I repel it, God releases that hupomone in my life. And you see, notice that the scripture says, um, it says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. In other words, there has to be a trying of your faith that works that type of hupomone. It doesn't just happen. That's the only way you can experience hupomone when your faith has been tried, okay? So whenever you experience anything bad in your life, don't rush to say, God is causing this in my life. God is doing this in my life. Look at this scripture again and again. Don't let your eyes leave it. Keep telling yourself, okay, so knowing this, and we've already um, seen that that word knowing means it's a continual knowing. It's a something that you do every single day. Knowing this, knowing this, understand this, remind this um, to yourself. Remind yourself that the trying of my faith, that the issues I'm going, the pro I'm going uh, through, the problems that I'm facing, they are working a certain patience. The moment I go through it, the moment I go over it, the moment I come out on the other side, the moment I endure it, there is a certain hupomone anointing that is coming over me. Oh, glory, hallelujah. So God releases that into your life. And that materiality makes you even stronger. You become even more invincible when you face attacks and you repel them. They don't touch you. You are not moved. You don't panic. You know, um, a prophet gave an example once where uh, Prince Charles 
was um, in Africa and he went to a safari. And during that safari, something went really, really wrong with one of the elephants. And the elephants started charging. One in particular started charging in the direction that Prince Charles was. And everybody scrammed. Everybody, journalists, the press, everyone in all directions running because the elephant was charging. And elephants are dangerous, as you already know. But Prince Charles just stood there like nothing was happening. And the story is told that the elephant then just changed direction, last minute, just changed direction and just went uh, another way. And so when people saw the bravery of Prince Charles, they asked him. So some reporters came to him and said, were you not afraid? This elephant was coming right at you and you just stood there like nothing was happening. Were you not scared? And he said something very profound. He said, I am trained because of my status, because I am royalty. I am trained to never show fear in the face of adversity. Imagine that. It doesn't mean that he couldn't see that this was a dangerous situation. He could see it. The man has eyes. He could see it. <laughs> he could see that this, this here is dangerous. But because he understood who he was. Now imagine, this is just a human understanding. Imagine that. What about you? The daughter of the true king of kings. The son of the true king of kings. Imagine. What of you? What about you? What about you? In the face of adversity, you run under the bed. You are crying. Even one sound in the ceiling. If you just hear something dropping in the ceiling, you hide under the bed because you are afraid, oh, the demons are here for me now. So you think the demon can't reach you under the bed. <laughs> I wonder how some of you actually think. Or you keep the light on. Oh, no, 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 no. Switch off the light. It means the demons will catch me. So they can't catch you when the light is on. They can't catch you in the daytime. You think they are only waiting for sleep time. <laughs> Imagine some of the things that we have heard, some of the things that you have presented to us, some of the prayer requests, some of the stories we've heard from Christians that go to church every Sunday, tongue-talking, Bible-believing Christians, afraid of the tiniest things. When persecution comes your way, you are the first one to check out of the scene. When your church goes through some kind of trouble, you are the first one to check out of that church. The very first one. Who are you really? Do you even know who you are? When the body of Christ is under attack, you are the first one to check out. You are the first one to disassociate yourself. Oh, no, um, I'm not part of these Christians. You know, Christians are terrible. And this is what you are telling the whole world. Where have you ever seen Muslims do that? Where have you ever seen Buddhists do that publicly? denouncing their own. They never do that. Of course they have fights. Of course they have factions. We already see that. There are so many variations of this whole Buddhism thing. So many variations of Islam. So many hundreds of variations. Which means there are arguments in there. There are split ups happening in there. But are they publicly saying them? Are they broadcasting it all over to say, uh, we have a prophet here. Uh, who is doing this? We have one of our uh, leaders who is doing this, one of our uh, uh, mosque leaders doing whatever. You never hear them say that, ever. Why? Because they know we have to be united. And yet in Christianity, we are the first ones to check out. The first ones. Do you think we are exempt from trying times? Whoever told you that we are exempt from trying times? We are not exempt. Our king, our God already warned us. He already told us in this world, you are going to have trouble. You are going to have it. He already said it. It's not a secret. Why are you so surprised? Why are you so shocked? Hey, why are these things happening to us Christians? Or oh, this is now bad. Christianity is in a bad space. Who told you that? Whoever told you that? It's now time to grow in hupomone. It's now time to grow. Once you go through issues, once you have been tried, you see, your works have to be tested by fire. They have to be tested by fire. When you come out on the other side, when you face things, and God is not the one who is throwing these things at you, by the way, but when you do go through those things, that's why James said, count it all joy. Count it all joy. Don't worry. You are going to come out of this. And when you come out of it, you're going to be stronger because God is pouring something over you. He's pouring hupomone all over you. And you become even more resilient. 
no matter what happens, you become even more invincible. Superman has nothing on you. You become a superhuman. Oh, yes. Something that has never been seen before. Something that has never been experienced before. That is exactly what God desires to do through you today. But you see, we have too many people who are afraid. Too many Christians who cry and cry. You even have groups for crying. If you need a shoulder, please come. You even know the sisters in church, the mothers in church, the fathers in church who are the best shoulders to cry on. And you recommend, oh, you know, if you ever have a problem, sister so-and-so, good listener. Ah, that one, <laughs> she's a good listener. You can cry all you like she does. She's so patient. You can cry. The shoulder is the best to cry on. You are even recommending others. If there is one thing I never, ever tolerate, it's crying. I don't know what to do with you if you cry. I don't know what to do with you. Because if you cry, what does it help? I used to be a crier. I used to cry all the time. Anything, crying, oh God, why, why is this happening? I used to think, oh, when you cry, you actually feel better. Something happens in all the negative toxins are out of your system. Just have a good one, just good crying session and you'll be fine afterwards. <laughs> I used to lie to myself too. Until one time, God spoke to me very clearly when we, uh, we had a problem going to St. Lucia and it was a whole mess up. It's a testimony for another day because I need to finish now, all right? And I started crying at the airport and it wasn't even my fault. These people had lost my luggage and I missed my uh, flight and we were supposed to be preaching. Prophet and I had um, traveled uh, separately, separately because I had booked my flight last minute. I hadn't intended to go, but last minute we decided, actually, let me just go. Prophet said, let's just go together. So his flight was full, I had to find another one. And then this problem happens on this other flight. They lose my bag and then I miss my uh, onward flight. And then I started crying in that airport. I wept, I didn't cry, I wept. <laughs> and these people just looked at me like, what are we supposed to do? And as I was crying, going to the other counter, just crying, just walking at the airport, crying, wiping away my tears and crying some more, it hit me so hard. God, did you see it? Just like that in that busy airport. God said, why are you crying? What does it help? Who are you helping by crying right now? Where is your faith? Where is your tenacity? Where is your hupomone? Where is it right now? So immediately I stopped crying. From that moment, I stopped crying. I walked over to the counter and I said, listen, you lost my bag. It's not my fault I missed this flight. You are going to do something about it. Immediately do something about it. And they said, actually, the flight that was uh, previously full, there's now one seat <laughs> and you can join that flight. And guess what? That was the same flight that Prophet was on that was previously full. And we ended up sitting next to each other, enjoying the flight together. But if I had carried on crying and crying, what would it have done? You see, from that day, I learned a very big lesson. And that was uh, years ago in early ministry. I learned a very big lesson. Crying does Zero, nothing. The only moments that God really wants you to cry are when you are in worship and you are just moved, moved to tears. All right? So don't have the habit of crying. I'm not saying sometimes you can cry because really uh, you can't help it. All right? But there are people who just cry for no reason. So I'm talking about the ones who cry for no reason. Okay. All right. So uh, I like uh, Daniel is saying, cry no more, guys. Exactly. <laughs> cry no more. All right. Crying doesn't help anything. Okay. Right. It does That's not right. help. All right. Just know when you cry, you're not helping any situation. When you go through something, stand firm, stand your ground, shake the whole thing off. Okay. I need to concentrate. Okay, this thing is happening. It's already happening. I've already been fired from my job. It's already happened. Now, what's the next step? What do I need to do? This is what I'm going to do. And the moment you do that, when you prove, remember trying means prove. That word trying there is prove. When you now prove your faith, when you now prove it, in the same way, Abraham had to prove. He had to prove his own faith. He had to prove his own love for the Lord by going to sacrifice his own son. And the all-knowing God suddenly had to say, actually, I needed the proof. Aren't you all-knowing? Hang on a minute. We thought God, uh, since, since you are God, you know everything. No, he had to prove. There is a proving of faith that had to be seen somewhere. And so when you do that, something is birthed in you. 
So hupomone is a divine endurance that will cause you to outlast any attack. You will outlast it. You will outlive it. That's what hupomone is. It's the supernatural ability to hang in there. <laughs> That's the simplest way of putting it across. It's a supernatural ability to just hang in there. No matter what happens, you endure it. No matter what comes your way, you endure it. And you have the power to do so. An ability, a supernatural ability to do so. I like what Prophet says. He says, thank God I don't look like what I've been going through. With some of you, we know when you are going through something. We can see it on your face. The moment you step into church, we are like, oh, okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. Trouble is here today. Things are not well. Things are not well. The sister is here. Watch the face. Watch the face. We can even tell your countenance from afar that things are not good uh, with you at home. When certain men come into church, you say, okay, something is wrong. You must show the world you are going through something. You must show everyone that I'm so sad today. No, I'm sad, I'm stressed today. You must show someone. That is not somebody who understands the word. When you understand the word, you know that whatever I'm facing, I am under a supernatural hupomone here. No matter the assault, no matter the storm, no matter the valley, no matter the width of this problem, no matter the length of it, no matter how high, how deep, no matter whatever, the diameter, the circumference of this problem, I am coming out on top. I count it all joy because I know I am at the top no matter what happens. A supernatural ability to endure all these things is already on me. So, oh, please, don't worry about me, brothers. Don't worry about me, sisters. People should never know that you are facing anything. People should even be shocked. I didn't know that you were going through this. Right. What happened with the Hebrew boys when they were in the fire? The Bible says when they came, when they walked out of that fire, there was no smell of smoke on their clothes. You couldn't even smell the smoke. There was not even a single hair that was singed in the fire. There was no residue of any fire on them. Nothing at all. At my house, we like to put um, fires outside. We like to sit by the fire. Not these days, though. Hey, it's now four degrees, <laughs> and it's going down fast. And so nobody wants to sit outside uh, right now in the UK. It's crazy. But we, we usually have lovely fires in the summer uh, at our house. We sit outside, and we have a nice fire. The thing that annoys me about those fires, every time we have a fire outside, is when I walk back into my bedroom, and I go in my closet, I can smell the smoke that came from outside. All windows were closed, but somehow the smoke has a way of creeping in through any small, tiny uh, crack somewhere. It will find its way into the house, and that annoys me. Now imagine these boys were in it. They were standing inside the fire, and yet no residue was on them. No sign that they'd gone through any fire. Oh, that's Hupamone, brothers and sisters. These boys understood it. They knew whatever the assaults, we will stand firm. Oh, bring it on, devil. Bring it on. And I like what they said. They said, even if God doesn't come to rescue us, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, they were even sarcastic about it. Oh, King, <laughs> even if our God doesn't come here today, it doesn't matter. We are not losing our faith. We are not letting go of our faith. We're not yeah. giving up on our God yeah. just because we are going through problems. They said it doesn't matter. Even if we die in this very fire today, even if we die, we don't care. We do not lose our faith. And yet here you are. There are people watching me right now. At least five times you've been born again, again. <laughs> because you said, oh, no, God, I'm now leaving this thing. I can't do this. I can't. This is now too much problems. I thought now if you become a Christian, things are just going to be good for you. But ah, for now, let me just take a break. This whole church thing, I'll take a break. And then you think again. You say, actually, okay, fine. Let me just receive the prayer of salvation. <laughs> Jesus, I, I accept you in my life and you are my king. You are my savior. Again. Five times you are born again, again and again. Why? Because you keep losing your faith. Where is your faith? These Hebrew boys were not born again like you. They had no Holy Spirit in them like you do. They didn't have the experience of the Spirit of God in them. They didn't have it. Their experience of God was external. It wasn't internal. And yet here you are fully loaded with the Spirit of God. And yet, one small issue, all the residue, we can see it on you. The smell of your problems is so pungent. We can smell from miles away you are broke. We can smell the broke on you. 
because you want to show everyone, I am so broke, I'm so, things are so bad. I've met broke people who look so amazing, you won't even know that they are going through any situation. They will never want to show the world that they're going through it. Why? Because they already understand, this I'm coming out of. I've already weighed the matter. Just like James said, count it all, count it, weigh it all, count it all joy. They've already weighed the matters. They've already seen it that, okay, this one, yeah, it's okay. This one, yeah, God's name is above that too. Yes, this one, this financial, yeah, yeah, God's name is above that one. Marriage problems, oh, God's name is above that one. What, what can God not do, really? Oh, I count it all joy. I count it all joy. There is nothing God cannot do. And I am coming out on top of these problems. That's what a real Christian ought to be, especially now more than ever. The Bible says, I'm pouring out my spirit on all flesh. And right now we see no evidence of the pouring on you. It's like the spirit was sprinkled on you <laughs> and not poured. Some are experiencing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on their lives. And here you are. We see no evidence, zero evidence of your Christianity. Who have you prayed for? And they were healed. Who did you pray for? And even yourself, never mind someone you prayed for. What about yourself? Which headache did you pray for? And it was gone. Which stomach ache did you even try to pray for? And it left you. Which one? Where is the proof of your Christianity? The Bible here says trying, trying, trying of your faith. Proving, proving, proving of your faith. That's what it means, trying, proving, proving. Where is the proof of your faith? During this lockdown, so many of you cried, oh, now we are about to die. Oh, this world, oh, now, yeah, this is sure death. I'm dying. I just might as well just say goodbye. Imagine some people even committed suicide because of COVID. True story. Here in the UK, we have people and all over the world. There were stories coming out in the news of people who committed suicide because they couldn't take it. They were so fearful, full of fear about this whole COVID uh, fiasco, full of fear. And they decided, right, I'm just going to die. And they killed themselves. For what? That's when you allow the demon of fear to eat you up from the inside. You don't know who you are. If you have that kind of fear, you don't know who you are. It's time for you to realize the importance of hupomone. There is a trying of faith. And the moment you go through that transition, something bigger happens in your life. You gain a supernatural ability. Divine endurance comes on you that will cause you to outlast anything. It will cause you to outlast, bring on anything, whether it's sickness, whatever, you will outlast it. That sickness will check out of your body. You will outlast it. That's hupomone. Now, what does uh, verse 4 say? Uh, as we um, get into our closing, it says, But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire. So in other words, let this hupomone have its perfect work in you, that you may be made perfect and entire, wanting nothing. In other words, if you don't go through a few challenges and you come out bigger, then there is no perfecting that is taking place in your life. It says you are only perfected. It says that you may be perfect. So if I want to know how to be perfect, then I need to know what James is saying here. He says, let Hupomone have her perfect work. Let it be done. Let it come to pass. Remembering that it is not God putting affliction on you. No. Remembering that affliction will come because the devil is the prince of these airwaves here on this planet. Understanding that. Being mature enough to understand that whenever I experience a challenge, I have to prove my faith. Every teaching I've been taught, I've been on YouTube, I've been on uh, Sky 596, I've been on Atom Gram, I've been listening to everything the prophet has been teaching. I've been watching Miracle TV. Now it's time to prove. The notes that you wrote, some of you have filled up notebook after notebook full of a wealth of knowledge, notes that you've been taking. Uh, when we say take out your notebook, yes, you've got your notebook. And it's full now. Your tablet is full. You've got so many notes on your tablet or on your phone. It's time to prove. It's time to prove that faith. Okay? So in order to be made perfect, then let this hupomone take place in your life. And then um, what uh, does it say in verse uh, number five? It says... 
Um, if any of you lack wisdom, I like this statement. If any of you lack wisdom, in other words, if any one of you watching this broadcast right now does not agree with anything that I have said, if you don't agree with this whole stance of Hupomone, if you don't agree with this whole stance about um, uh, challenges coming your way and your ability to prove your faith when you meet those challenges, if you don't understand it, if you don't uh, agree with it, James had a simple solution. He said, I really can't help you then, but here's a solution for you. If any of you lack wisdom, please take it up with God. <laughs> don't ask me any more questions because I've already told you if you lack wisdom in this very simple area then please ask they go to the to the king that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not he doesn't hold back and it shall be given him so he will give you the wisdom he doesn't hold back he will give you the understanding as for me I've done my part I've already explained to you exactly how these things work so next time you face a challenge next time you go through something Next time you see a wind blowing into your household, a dark wind blowing into your household, stand firm, stand firm. Don't be perturbed at all. Don't even cry. Don't cry. It's not going to help you. Just like I was told at the airport, please, this is not going to help you. Don't cry. Stand your ground. Remember, who am I? Who am I? I'm royalty. I am royalty. I cannot react in this way. I cannot act like this. I have enough of God's word in me. I've been trained in this word. I've joined the broadcasts. I've joined, I've been to the conferences. I have been taught these things. I know what to do. I'm not going to cry. Okay, let me deal with this situation. Head on. I'm going to face the devil. And I am going to do whatever I need to do to get this problem to check out of my house. When you do that, hupomone. When your faith has been proven, hupomone. And then you become perfect. You are perfected in this thing. You become a master. At it. So whenever anything happens, you don't cry. Some of your pillows, they are tired now. They can tell us stories. If your pillow could tell us some of your stories, we would hear them all. Your tears have stained your pillows, crying every night. And since you started crying, what did it help? Since you started blaming God, oh, God is just tempting me and God is teaching me a lesson. Uh, I'm sure the lesson is going to be over soon. Five years you've been learning one lesson. Five years you suffered with migraine headaches and it's, we are still in a lesson. It's either God is a bad teacher or you are a bad student. And we know God can never be a bad teacher. So you are the one who is in the wrong. God is not teaching you lessons by giving you meningitis, by giving you breast cancer, by giving you COVID-19. God is teaching us a lesson. Since when? Since when? Honestly, God being God can't teach his children without punishing them, without hurting me. Why can't you teach me without hurting me? Why can't you teach me without always having to punish me? I have to suffer for this teaching. What kind of God is that? Not the God of the Bible, brothers and sisters. That is not God at all. So whenever you go through something, I want you from now onwards to understand that I know who I am, number one. I am royalty, so I am not afraid of anything. That's number one. Number two, whatever challenge I face, God already warned me. He said, in this world, you shall have trouble. So I already know there will be trouble lurking somewhere, somehow. But my reaction to it is what determines who I am exactly. That will show me who I am. My faith will be proven as a result. I know that I am not alone. I know I have taken a stance under. I am under. I am abiding under God. So there's no way I am alone. There's no way I'm facing issues alone. I am sitting in a bulldozer. I can bulldoze my way around any situation and any problem. There is nothing I cannot face. So I understand that. So any trying time that I'm going through, if my faith is tried, if I'm thrown into a fire, what is my reaction going to be? Am I going to prove my faith or am I going to falter? Am I going to just sit down in that fire and say, okay, God, um, Please open up the pearly gates, apostles, I'm coming. Abraham, I'm coming to your bosom now. Please open up, open up in the next approximately one minute. I'll be dead. Please, I'm coming now. What is your reaction going to be? Life and death, the Bible says, lies in the power of your tongue. What is it that you're going to say about your situation? What is it that you're going to say? How is it that you're going to act? What kind of Christian soldier are you? And I like soldiers. I like soldiers, Christian soldiers, that is. Because Christian soldiers are not afraid of anybody. 
Christian soldiers are strong. They understand that we are an army, the best army in the world. We can face anything. Our God is the greatest commander. We can go through it all. All right? So understand. You understand that? You are perfected. You become invincible. Superman definitely has nothing on you. All those X-Men, they got nothing on you. Trust me. X-Men, Superman, Incredible Hulk, and all those other people. I prophesy these people, by the way. I don't know them. Um, all of them, they've got nothing on you. Nothing at all on you. So start practicing it. Right now, practice it. Some of you have already received text messages to try and prove what you've just learned today. Your sister has already started slandering you right now. Your brother, your cousin, your family members, they've already started right now. We're going to see that Hupo Monet in demonstration. We want to see that faith in demonstration. Prove your faith. Let's see it. Let's see it happen right now. I'm not out of good news. I'm just out of time. Love you guys and see you on Friday. Prophet will be here and he'll be ministering something extra special uh, to you guys. So see you on Friday. Bye for now.